It's too late. I found the start button. <laughs> All right. So welcome to the Lovecraft Easing podcast, everyone. Uh, those of you watching live, this is what our third episode going back live, not counting Thursday night. So, um, you know, let me know if you can see us and hear us. I don't know why I'm not showing up again. Uh, we'll figure it out. I see you. You see me? Yeah, I see you too. Yeah. yeah. All right. Do you guys see me when we talk? Um, show self view. There we go. One of those problems yeah. I probably should have figured out before, um, before we started. Anyway, welcome. I'll figure this out in a second. Um, to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast, what I will do is, why don't you guys all introduce yourselves, and I'll figure figure this out. Pete, you wanna you wanna go? Uh, Pete Rollick, uh, writer, um, man about town. Uh, soon on um, on stage, you know, singing my version of putting on the Ritz. Hmm. All right, Rick. Uh, Tony, you're our guest today. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Is this your first book, Thanks. The Forbidden Knowledge? While I figure yeah. this out. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Mike. I'm really happy to be here with, with you and Pete and Rick. And um, yeah, Forbidden Knowledge is my literary debut. I've had a couple of short stories published, but this is the longest piece yet. And um, essentially, it's uh, their bookends, the two novellas in Forbidden Knowledge, two tales of Lovecraftian terror, <laughs> are, are bookends to H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness and function as uh, kind of an origin story for the sidekick in that fabled tale, uh, Danforth, young Danforth, the uh, graduate student who, as Pete and I were talking about, the graduate students have a very different perspective <clears throat> from the professor's. Um, Professor yeah. Dyer is the narrator in that story, but he's always ragging on <clears throat> Danforth, who's doing a lot of the work. And uh, one of the things that we know about Danforth is that he is one of the few people who have read the Necronomicon in its entirety. And so Forbidden Knowledge, the first half, answers the question of, why would you do that? <laughs> yeah. So, and the uh, second half takes us to New Zealand, um, where we kind of counterbalance the two tales and they meet up in the end in, in an interesting way and uh, are informed by a lot of the international travel that my wife and I have been fortunate to undergo. So that's just kind of the basis of of the uh, of the tales, the two tales. Well, you, you're, you're, uh, you have a passion for Lovecraftian horror is what I was reading about you. Mm -hmm. um, tell us how that started and when. When did you first get into Lovecraftian horror? So I would say my first exposure to Lovecraftian horror would be when I was, it would be 1990, I think six or seven, <laughs> when Alone in the Dark came out for Mac. It had already been released on PC, but the old uh, computer oh, yeah. game Alone in the Dark. And so... At about eight, nine years old, maybe 10, my brother and I were playing the demo of the one room you get at the start of the game in the attic of <laughs> Derceto. And that was really fascinating. And I always remembered that experience. That was sort of my first exposure, but I, I had no idea what Lovecraftian horror entailed or who Lovecraft even was. Right. I'd say the next milestone was, I was in sixth grade, so fast forward a few years. And... Mr. Lianis, my sixth grade English literature teacher, uh, one day I'm I'm coming in right at the bell. And I, Mr. Lianis, I got to go to the bathroom. I'm sitting right in the front row. I'm looking around and he's just sitting on a stool staring us down. He's got this big brushy mustache and he's twirling it. And he doesn't say a word until the bell rings. And then he says... <laughs> Did he have a cat on his lap too? <laughs> he should have. He should have had a skull or something. And then he literally performs the entirety of Telltale Heart. And I'm wow. Mr. Leonis, I go to the, yes, but you know, I didn't do, I did it. I did it. Oh man. He was fully in character. <laughs> so that was, that was 
that was a very impressionable experience. But I didn't really get into Lovecraftian horror until I bought the game Arkham Horror in about 2013 after playing, I don't know if you guys ever heard of the VHS-based board game Nightmare. Hmm. No, what, does, what, it, what was it exactly? I found it at Goodwill. Um, I believe it was came out in 92. And it's a board game where you are six creatures from all sorts of literary corners, these demons and whatnot, trying to get to the center of the graveyard, one dice roll at a time. And everybody's greatest fear is in the center coffin. And the person holding you back from leaving the graveyard is the gatekeeper. And I've to play heard the of game, him, and he was in Ghostbusters. <laughs> I think, right? And the key master. Um, the gatekeeper, it basically would appear on this VHS tape that you played that increasingly became more intense and creepy over the course of an hour. And he would interrupt the clock that was ticking down and the music would ramp up and he'd always address you just as lazy maggots. Who is the youngest? I want to play a game. Roll the dice. <laughs> if you do not roll a six, you are banished. I've never just, heard of this. This sounds it, awesome. It's, check it out. It was really fun. I played it with some friends. We, uh, at, we for a couple of years, we played it around like a campfire or Halloween. We would pull out it, some way to screen, you know, screenshot it. Or, yeah. It was really fun. Candles and everything. And, you know, you get a couple of drinks and you're, yes, my gatekeeper. And everybody's rolling the dice. It It's cool. So Arkham Horror. I discovered after I Googled games with mechanics that you, you know, you play against the game. There's no actual, it's not asymmetric. There's not someone playing the villain. Yeah. So <clears throat> long story short, I bought Arkham Horror from Fantasy Flight Games with the intention of playing it. Never played it. I read the instructions with my wife a couple of times. This was like 2013, you, you said? 2013, 14. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. And, um, yeah, I owned the game for about eight years and never ended up playing it because I guess <laughs> I fell down to, I, I jumped to Elder Signs and then tried Mansions of Madness where I just got hooked. And then once I started playing Mansions of Madness, I didn't ever get into Call of Cthulhu, but I have now. And what really kicked it off was I wanted to research who this Lovecraft character was. And then I found Wayne June reading oh yeah he's a six cd set yeah he's amazing i just his voice drew me in and so i basically have only ever read printed copies of the festival and um pickman's model everything else i've only ever listened to wayne june reading it and so part of my process with writing is i don't actually hear him dictating the words but as i'm reviewing it the cadence and tone of his voice as he's describing the, the necrophagous, vaporous, <laughs> oozing monster creeping out of the dungeon. He has this really evocative uh, style of reading that. Yeah, he, he narrated, um, I forget which, Lovecraftian game several years ago. We had him on the show. Oh. He's a really, oh, really nice guy. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. about 2015, I think, Pete, Rick, something like that. Darkest Dungeon? Yes, Darkest that Dungeon. It? Yeah, why, I've never played Rob, that. Why are you but... shaking your head at me? Because mm -hmm. I don't remember what I had for breakfast, let alone what happened in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. So, yeah, he's... Uh, <laughs> he told me that he he did a lot of his recording in the morning, you know, when his voice was deeper than later in the day. So, oh, that's neat. Yeah. Before I, you have coffee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Still yeah. got that nighttime phlegm going on, right? <laughs> yeah. God. Oh, that reminds me. The one of the first words I tried to teach my my our, our eldest daughter, who's now almost four, was red rum, red <laughs> rum. And my wife, she keeps giving me the side eye. Come on, cut it out, cut it out. That girl's getting raised right. Exactly. Yeah, we're on the way over to the park before to drop her off on my way here. And she wants to keep listening to Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet fantasy overture. Oh, so nice. I don't know. Yeah. Do you, how many kids do you have? You know, I've got two girls. Um, mm -hmm. Maria is nearly four and Sonny is one and a quarter. 
So Pete, uh, what, have you seen the show before or listened, Tony? I think you said I watched. Did. Yeah, uh, that's the one with Gwen, and then the uh, Batman, the uh, Batman episode as well. Uh, with uh, Sam. I believe that was just last Thursday. Oh, yeah, that was me just blathering. Which people seem to like on Thursday nights, uh, yeah. But I was I was saying, Pete, tell him your. I'm always fascinated by the way you're teaching your daughters about horror. Oh, in movication. Whatever. Yeah. You know, because you know, we we started with you know some some classics, Terror Island. Uh. uh where we oh i was and i was doing this thing where i was working up i was filling them in with all these films to so that they would have everything they needed to recognize everything that was going on in um cabin in the woods mm. right i got and so I many watch that movie right because there's yeah. so many reference so many uh easter eggs and whatnot in there right mm -hmm. yep and then like i was like three weeks i was ready to do it three weeks away and my mother-in-law said oh let's watch this when i was not even around showed them cabin in the woods no and, and i was like they're ah. not they've not progressed there yet they weren't ready for that they hadn't right. seen the hellraisers or you know there were things that i was waiting for right and you know it's just nope nope well, plus the fact that you didn't get to watch it with them the first time. And I didn't get to watch it with them. Although, right. I, I guess two weeks ago, we watched Children of the Corn. <laughs> <laughs> it was horrifically bad. Right. You know, my mm. wife and I are sitting, oh, you're going to love this. We're going to love this. And we're like watching this. It's like, this is really fucking bad. Yeah, it's like Blair Witch. Um, yeah. You know, I, I like to scare Danielle with, with horror movies. And so a couple of years ago. Because when Blair Witch came out, it it was creepy. It seemed creepy at the time for me and for a lot yeah. of people. So I, I'm like, we got to watch Blair Witch, Danielle. It's gonna really going to creep you out. And she's a scaredy cat. And at the end of the movie, she was like, that wasn't scary. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's not as good as I remember, I guess. <laughs> right. Rick was trying to say something. Rick. How old are you? How old are you, kids? 14 and 15. So, yes, there are some things that we probably, you know, like, all right. So I have not watched Reanimator with either one of my children yet because what? there's there's a scene that I just can't watch with two young girls. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. So, I'm just not going to do that. Yeah, they can right. watch on their own when they're ready. Um, but, yes. And then, you know, for the same reason from Beyond. Now, Dunwich Horror, the original... Eh, that's not so bad, right? It's, it's really fun when they play that at Necronomicon. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Columbus Theater. Don't spoil it for people. Oh, okay. Did it come out sixty three? Uh, I think it's later than that. Was it, I want to say seventy three? But and this is past the five year Raleigh rule. It is, but no, no, no. There's right. there's something special that's done with the Dunwich Horror at Necronomicon. Oh, I I, I don't know that then. Yeah. Rick, were you going to say something? We're talking about the, um, the American Stock National Black. version. Yes. 1970. 1970? Okay. It's got a great soundtrack, too. Yeah, it does. It sounds like a jazz band that, you know, <laughs> that's all on the bus with their instruments and they just crashed sometimes. But it's got that that fun creeping tone that yeah, reminds Les, me of the thing. Yeah. That Les Baxter did that, that, that music. Mm -hmm. um, he, um, he did this, he, he developed this sort of his own style of easy listening music. Les Baxter. He called it exotica. Ooh. So yeah, it's kind of really, really strange stuff. I've, you know, I go to Necronomicon every time, but I've never seen Dunwich Horror there. Sunday nights. So you, you, okay. All right. So you blew the secret. So Sunday night, there's I didn't a all blow anything. <laughs> I don't even know the secret. <laughs> hey, we should go. We should all go. Are you going this year, Mike? To yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's neat. And we were talking, Pete and I were talking. Rick, do you go to Necronomicon or have you frequented it in the past? I I have a problem with traveling away. Right okay, cool. I didn't mean to assume. I just wanted to ask. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, there's a special show with the Dunwich Horror that you should go to, Mike. Um, but it's at midnight at the at the uh, the theater down the across I ninety five. Subtext: It's too late for you, old man. Just go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Subtext: You made that decision by default. <laughs> It's, it's like the Rocky Horror. Right? Yes. Oh wow! Yeah, I should do it then. Yeah. Yes. Minus the the fish nets, right? Um, uh, fish nets would be the. I hope not. Uh, yeah. Well, you've seen it, uh, uh Tony. Yes. Yes. Fish nets would be um. They they oh. they're, Yeah. Yeah. They yeah, exactly. working. Because <laughs> hmm. there's plenty of fish. Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Uh, this is your first book, is that right? Or am I? Yeah. I... Yeah, that's so. I didn't see another one. Um. Yeah, forbidden knowledge: two tales of Lovecraftian horror. Tony Lamalfa. Hey, so what is it? Do you think, Tony, about cosmic horror, Lovecraftian horror, that draws you in? That that fascinates you? I think the style that Lovecraft wrote in where everything is very vivid, even though the text is, you know, people call it that purple, purple prose. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. I think it was more the board games that got me into it. Right. Um, I love the 1920s. I'm obsessed with that, that time period, 20s and the 30s, to the point where I actually, um, I actually wrote a play about my hometown here in Marinette, Wisconsin, um, during prohibition. And I used local history to wow. inform it. So it was hysterically fictional yet historically factual in some ways. <laughs> it was, it was fun. It had, um, you know, a secret code that was left with the body that was found in the river that people assumed the local bootleggers left there. And, um, you know, there's two sides of the law, there's the city and the county, and there's some people caught in between trying to solve the whole mystery. And then there's this great finale where Al Capone shows up and there's a gunfight. And then, wow, is this so, something that you could you could share like on your website or or no? Yeah, yeah. Um, it would be, it sounds. I have really a link cool. to it. Oh, yeah, it's, it's. I I have the videos. Actually, my dad my dad recorded them. Uh, the the Sunday performance of the first weekend because we actually wrote this with the help of my wife, who's my chief editor. And we put it on at the local theater in 2017. Mm -hmm. And I got to actually act in it too. It was kind of fun. Um, but anyway, I, I guess I had that passion for, I can share that link with you afterwards. Um, sure, that'd be great. But it was called Menominee River Mysteries, the summer of 27. Um, so the video is available. I have a, like a, a WordPress website that uh, describes the production, the people, the characters, the places that are still exist around town. Some of them, which are kind of cool. And yeah, but that's, I, I'm just, I guess I like that time period. I, I love, um, I love how Lovecraft's stories are slow burns and there's usually a twist. And again, that I'll just call it the Wayne June factor of yeah. hearing somebody tell you a story is very luxurious. When you think about how long storytelling goes back in human history how essential it is and uh, yeah, exactly. what a craft it can be that's why i'm so puzzled at people who think that listening to an audio book or someone reading a short story is not actually reading um it is reading is actually as i think a couple of weeks ago you pointed out pete re reading in the big picture is just the printed pages to consume stories is fairly recent you know right but I wanted mm -hmm. to touch on two things. One, yep. Merrimack, Merrim, yeah, is where you, is not too far from Sauk City, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where Derelith and Arkham House are. Were that's right? They're downstate. Yeah. Right. And I, Second, I honestly didn't know much about Derelith oh, until yeah. I think I got into once I saw you guys at Necronomicon, and I started 
connecting with S.T. Joshi. And then I went back and read, you know, part of Lovecraft's bi biography and I'm discovering all these things, all the, all the Lovecraft circle. It's really neat. Right. So, but, sorry. Yeah. So no, 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 that's great. I mean, it's like, so I would, if I were you, I would look at what you've written and then like, see if you can make it into a Derelethian story. Mm. And, and milk it for something because you you know it's not that far he wrote a lot of sack prairie stuff and okay. you know uh what is it um the i, I think it's is it the dweller in darkness rick the Cthulhu story anyway there's a there's a derelict story it, it, it's, it's it's in wisconsin yeah mm -hmm. set in wisconsin at uh, rick's lake <laughs> ironically uh, there you go ironically yeah um the other thing i'm going to say to you is that i spent a um a month one week in madison and um got to stay at this old hotel right on the lake and um i got back to my hotel room uh after the first day and i had no power so they had actually had been, we were doing work on the hotel and they cut my power oh. <laughs> and they were like, we're really, really sorry. Um, we only have one room left in the hotel mm -hmm. and it's the Al Capone suite. Nice. <laughs> and I was like, what's the Al Capone suite? And they say, well, here they give me this key and it's like this, this um, art deco key. It's like, put this into the elevator and, you know, turn it. Turn, there's a keyhole oh, in the sweet. elevator, and you take it, <laughs> and it goes up, and it basically goes to the roof of the hotel, mm -hmm. and the hotel has this whole. It's like a porch that has been built out over the lake. Oh wow! And it's just it's like three bedrooms and a kitchen. It's it's a, it's a suite that it sits out over the lake, and apparently this is that they told me. This is where Al Capone would go to fish, and they would just he would just sit in the hotel and on the in this in this room, and he would fish off the hotel into the lake. Hmm. Wow! That's and I get to, I get to spend three nights there, um, but huh. you know, so oh, wow. like Wisconsin apparently has an Al Capone tie-in. Mm hmm. I, Up north, um, there are places in Pembine, north along the Menominee River, um, which is right outside the door here. Uh, he would purportedly had a cabin or cabins. They would go up to, would cool off when things got a little hot down in Chicago. Chicago, yeah. Yeah. That's what they were telling me, that Wisconsin was his place to come and get away from the things. Okay. John Derringer, too, I think it was. Okay. Right? Derringer? Dillinger. Sorry, Dillinger. Dillinger? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, as well. Uh had had cabins, I think, up in the UP or places to go. What was the, what was the Johnny Depp film again about John Dillinger? Um oh, enemies, yeah. no, when, the one enemies. where he was undercover. Public enemy number one. Oh, okay. You guys ever see that one? I don't think I, so. Vaguely. Long time ago. Okay. But yeah, so it's it's like I've been to the I've been to that area where, yeah. where you, you're at. It's it's very nice. Um Mm -hmm. I liked Madison while I was there. Yeah, it's a great town. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of a lot of research going on out of UW Madison and a lot yeah. of a lot of cool restaurants and places to go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, you you are, there's writing about weird fiction and cosmic horror, and then there's writing about whatever you want to say, Lovecraftian horror, pastiche, mm -hmm. um, which is what you're writing. It, it does have kind of a to some people i wrongly it has a bad connotation because there's been some bad really bad lovecraftian horror written but mm -hmm. you know that doesn't mean pastiche is bad um I, I say all this to say this pete i don't know if you ever read any of pete's books but <laughs> you would all really right. love them you know so have you opened up your book this book mike yeah all right so you saw my blurb no Mike, Mike wrote an awesome blurb. I have to thank you again on air here. You you wrote an awesome blurb. Yeah, it's on the it's on page two. Oh, I went right past that. Yeah. Well, I read this. This is really really good. Mm -hmm. I I the if only skin deep. 
I had never thought of mashing up Margaret Mead with the Cthulhu Mythos. But as soon as I figured it out, it was like, yeah, this makes perfect sense. I'll be honest. I wish I could take credit for it intentionally doing that, but... No, no, no. You never say that. You're like, yeah, that's yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. what There's more of a story, though, to it. Um, <laughs> my wife and I actually traveled through New Zealand and Australia woofing. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. Um, it's a work exchange where you hang out at someone's farm for free. You work for free, but you get free room and board. And there's a whole network and background checks and things, so it's a really legit program. Mm -hmm. And we did it. We traveled around the U.S. doing that in 2015-16, and uh, we decided in 2017 to try to take take a hand at that. So, the the place in If Only Skin Deep and the characters are all very authentic to where we were on the southern island on the western coast. Um, there's actually a little town named Hokitika where the story takes place, and the bluffs that I described there just north of Hokitika are as raw and as beautiful as I try to convey. And the character Miriam, they're actually at the time that we were woofing on this really awesome farm with um, Diana and her uh, husband, uh, the, the Blights, their name was. So I changed that to the Blythes. And so they were sort of proxies for the, the couple okay. Miriam stays with. And the other woofer, they call them, the other volunteer there was this French gal, Miriam... Uh, and she became the basis for the character. And then I added different components as far as her psychology goes. So she's it's not a carbon copy, but just this really stoic, adventurous young woman. She'd grab a bag of oats and she'd just go hiking up to the mountains. And she'd come back a couple of days later and we'd work on the farm. Meanwhile, we're, you know, trying to tour tour the city and and check out different aspects of that awesome yeah. little town. But it's just um so yeah, I, I wish I I'll, I'll admit it. I wish I could take the credit for the anthropological anthropological aspect uh, coming from Margaret Mead, but Miriam, um, I just I, I wanted a person who was completely foreign to that part of the world, and but had this drive and desire because I myself am really interested in the um, in the Maori culture. Um, while we were there, we actually went to a living village in Rotorua. The same one Miriam goes to to visit early in the story, and um, it was such such an impressionable impressionable place. Um, the 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 culture, the the landscape, the the people, everything about it was just so breathtaking well, that I decided it, it just it was the perfect setting for a story. Yeah, let me read a Pete's blurb with forbidden knowledge. Tony Lamalfitz establishes himself as an extraordinarily new Lovecraftian voice. Extraordinary, that is. The face on the floor channels not only Lovecraft, but Clark Ashton Smith as well, supplying an explanation to a long-pondered passage from one of the Master's greatest tales. Meanwhile, in If Only Skin Deep, the author expertly invokes Margaret Mead to lead the reader into seemingly familiar Lovecraftian territory, only to betray them with a wonder, wondrously diabolical twist. LaMalfa's premiere is both delightful and tantalizing, and I look forward to is yet to come. What is yet to come? Pete Rollick, author of The Weird Company. Right. All right. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna do a flashback. Do you remember when we did the left right game? Mm -hmm, I do. And I went off for I twenty do. minutes. Symbolism <laughs> of the names. <laughs> And then the author was like, yeah, those are great. I didn't know any of that. <laughs> I, he I thought he found all these point. Easter eggs and, and tie-ins and things. So, yeah. yeah. And now, now I'm thinking that you've read Margaret Mead and you, you've, you know, you've expertly transported her to Lovecraft. And now I'm just going to like turn in my, <laughs> my Lovecraftian scholar card and uh, call it a day. Well, I didn't see the blurb. You obviously know who Pete is, but you'd love his work, Tony. Um, mm -hmm. Now, um, this is available on Kindle Un Unlimited as well, I believe. Is that right? So yeah, yeah, through through Hippocampus Press, Amazon paperback, Kindle, uh, Barnes and Noble. Yeah. 
So if you, if you got Kindle uh, Unlimited, it's free. What, Rick, sorry? I have the Kindle. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Um, Excellent. Cool. So, Thank you. Tony, you, um, before we started, you were at, you wanted to ask me some questions about something. Ah, the yes. America. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike, you mentioning wanting to read, um, that I would dig Pete's work and I, um, I want, I was tailgating and, uh, asking Pete some questions about the weird company because I really appreciated how authentically written, um, it was from a biology standpoint, the, 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 the science and the descriptions, it was, it was really in depth that I thought, well, this must be authentic to, to Pete's experience. Um, because I knew you worked, uh, your work with the Everglades and things. So I, I, I was curious if that informed your work and wondering if you could expound on that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, I, so in high school I was pre-med. Mm -hmm. And I, I went through some programs to, and did a lot of work in medicine and um, was working toward a biology degree, thinking that I was going to go into medicine and worked in a lot of hospitals as a, in pathology and the laboratory and in phlebotomy and really discovered that I hated people <laughs> uh, and sick people are terrible. And Mike is laughing his ass off. You know, sick, sick they're so, I mean, they're so they're so grouchy yeah. when they're yeah. in pain like just, that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just like you. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm grouchy. <laughs> maybe, maybe occasionally. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what I did was I I moved over to uh, marine biology and aquaculture. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I got it. Came out of a uh, university at uh, Florida Tech in Melbourne. Um, completely prepared to spend life at sea mm -hmm. and instead got a really good job um, with a state agency in Palm Beach uh, working on, on Everglades restoration um, 34 years ago, 1991. Holy. So you've only had one job? Well, <laughs> I I started as at an entry level position and no, I'm not like, making fun of you. It's cool. Yeah, I've been at the same agency for thirty four years, I guess. Nice. Wow. Three years. And what yeah. impactful work too to commit your life to? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes and no, or yeah, take the, yeah. take the compliment. Yes, 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 absolutely, yes. But no, and but what that has done allowed me to do over the course of thirty years is. I've collected samples um, in the Kissimmee River, Lake Okeechobee, the Everglades, Florida Bay, Biscayne Bay, the mm -hmm. 10,000 Islands. It's really put me all over the map of South Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and I've used a lot of equipment um, and I've worked with National um, Science Foundation, uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison, um, USGS, EPA, um, biological service just wow. a lot of other agencies and um learned a lot and done a lot um so yeah uh my career has informed my science writing fictionally right. um i've only ever written two stories about my job um one was in matt barlett's wxxt collection and the other one was in a uh, uh, Chaosium collection. Oh, cool. So, but yeah, I I have a lot of stories to tell about working at my job. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to write them yet. Because, um, you know, I still want I still have a few years left. Right, right. Uh, 2029 is when I'm done. So yeah. Streisand was singing about you. Pe I, people who hate, hate people. People. They're the luckiest people in the luckiest world. People in the world. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's not that I hate people. It's just, yeah. all right. Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> no, it's just, you know, sometimes I think people are really, really stupid. And I I just have no patience for, for that. 
and then I just throw up my hands and then walk away. Mm. And it turns out you can't do that as a as a medical professional. No. Um. So I'm picturing yeah. house right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you when you say that, Pete, about talking about people and and hating people, it reminds me of uh, if you guys saw Leave the World Behind, that recent. Mm. Yeah, I have, my kids have watched. Yeah. I have not watched it yet. What's okay, it okay. Her, her, her character has a similar uh, disposition <laughs> toward okay. people, um, but it's about an urban family, I believe, in in New York, um, getting out of the city and going to an Airbnb. It's uh, you know, a husband and wife, and they're they're two teenage kids, boy and a girl, mm-hmm. and uh, as they leave, strange. Strange events start happening, and then at one point, without completely giving anything away, the Airbnb or the B and B guest uh, hosts actually show up again, asking to stay the night. Oh, is this? Who are the actors in this? I think I might have seen a little bit of the trailer. Uh, Ethan Hawke and um, Julia Roberts. Yeah, and, <laughs> I thought um, it looked interesting, so I stopped watching the trailer. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> which yep. is the opposite of what most people do. Marashala Ali. Yeah, I think um, it was even produced by Barack and M- Michelle Obama. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I should watch it for that reason alone. Yeah. Mm. No, but I, you know, and to be honest with you, I have a lot of horror stories from my time in the medical field. Like, mm-hmm. one of the things we had to do was when you're transferring shifts, you have to account for everything that's not locked away. So if there's like samples and receiving, you have to exchange, you know, sign off and exchange them. And it's like, oh, yeah. so we're doing that. It's like, oh yeah, by the way, there's a leg in the in the in the walk-in. And I'm like, what? Somebody got an amputee? Said, no, no, the cops brought it in. They found it on the street. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, it's just like. So there's a murder. It's like, oh no, no. Technically, you can live without a leg. So, it's it's not murder yet. Mm-hmm. It's goodness. Yeah, you know, things like that. But you know, yeah. Stuff so you should get hazard pay for, huh? But now you can write about, right? Yeah, now I can write about the it. leg in the fridge by the Pete. Leg Roll. in the fridge. The couple that comes in on the on the, the one stretcher. Because they're stuck um, <laughs> together. Hey, Mike. Things like that. DeBronzo. Hey. Hey. That's cool. Better, oh, DeBronzo, I gotta go. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me uh, read the back of this. Forbidden knowledge. Okay, it's available on Kindle Unlimited by Tony Tony Lamafa. Two graduate students walk the winding road to madness. One in New England. The other, in, the other in New Zealand, yet each suffers silently, facing grave danger when their curiosity gets the better of them. In two novellas, Tony LaMalfa has weaved a rich tapestry of Lovecraftian horror that evokes shade of the master himself. The face on the floor explores the fate of the young Jonathan Danforth's tortured involvement with Andre Oswald, a, fr- a fellow student at Miskatonic University whose quest to read the Necronomicon engulfs Danforth in a baffling web of horror and tragedy. If only skin deep takes us to New Zealand, where the young scholar Miriam Delacroix investigates a remote tribe that seems to have have anomalous relations with nameless entities from the sea. The revelation Miriam experiences at the end of an an, uh, enigmatic ceremony sorry is soul shattering so yeah if, if you like Lovecraftian horror and I assume you do if you're watching um, pick this up so. I, and so the first story which I really liked was uh, for, first um, I think it has a really good depiction of Miskatonic University which you know we need more of um, second there was that um uh a short movie short uh, episode of whatever oh uh, uh, the uh, cabinet of curiosities which did 
a very bad, very bad version of Dreams in the Witch House. Yeah. I don't know why there are some very similar touch points between that and Lo- Tony's um, first novella here, but I think Tony does it much better. Um, Thank you. In fact, I've actually you know, not seen episodes of Cabinet of Curiosities. I'm oh, a real you should, you, noob you should, when it comes to this community. You should watch that because okay. I, th- I think you will, s- if, if this had come out before Dreams in the Witch House, mm-hmm. I would be contacting a lawyer um because it's there are some really very interesting touch points there okay so um Neat. Thank the, you. The, the subplot there is a, a missing sister um uh, okay. in 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 relation to lovecraftian horrors and in the necronomicon so okay yeah anyway that's cool, that's cool. i i really have to touch on the point there are so many people to thank that the book even got to this stage um and the same year that I was at Necronomicon where I met you, Pete, 2022, I got to tell you guys this story because it just illustrates how much of a noob I really am to this. Because um, I don't have a background in literature. I studied physical education and health. And I may have a, have art teachers for my mom, my dad, my stepdad. So I got a lot of creativity in the family, but I never pursued music or theater or anything like that till I was older. Well, you know... And- uh... Paul Tremblay is a math teacher. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So you don't have to have that kind of background. John Langan teach. Right. What does John Langan teach? Right. Langan, uh, I don't know he's what he's tra- teaching right now. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, he's a teacher too. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. That's neat. So cool. Um, I want to just, because this is really funny. After the, um, so we went on the walking tour day one of Necronomicon. 2022. That was the Thursday walking tour with Rory Raven. It's the second year I'd done that. Love, love his tours and um, went to the opening ceremony. I was there with my good friend, Evan Van Driel, who is an inspiration to my writing as well. And after the opening ceremony, we're walking back with this wonderful dad, David, and then um, the poet laureate um, from Laos, uh, Brian, and there was a woman who, they were ahead of me and there was a woman who was looking for directions and I stopped and I was chatting with her and she had this tag for the convention on it. Oh yeah. And we were walking and talking on our way to the Biltmore or the Graduate Providence. And and so I, I have my my business cards that our Airbnb guest, our, our host was was pushing me to, yes, you should get out there, give people your cards and I'm giving her my card and I'm, I'm a nobody in this field. And here I am, I walked uh, Gemma Files to her, the hotel, not knowing who she was. And then I was like, oh, Evan, you know, that's, I met this really nice one and uh, we had a great conversation. <laughs> so that's, well, that's that, where I'm yeah, coming from. This nice woman, field. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so I look back and I'm like, don't, don't, you shouldn't have known that. <laughs> yeah. Have so you read, kind of the, uh, have you read her book, uh, um, experimental film? I've not. Yeah, yeah, you should really check that out. Put it on the list, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely put it on the list. Yeah, yeah. put it on the list. Well, um, so guys, pick this up: uh, "Forbidden Knowledge: Two Tales of Lovecraftian Horror" by Tony Lamalfa. Um, Tony, we're gonna. What we usually do is we we talk to our guests for a bit, as we just did, and then mm-hmm. we talk about a few more things for another little bit. You can. You can go or you can stay, or you're certainly welcome to stay. So, oh, yeah, I'd love to. Just a bunch of nerd talk. So, no, I love that. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So, I asked everybody, I asked the people watching live what they're reading. Kim says, I'm reading The Night Circus bit by bit. And you'll like this, Rick. She says, Making My Way Through Dark Shadows, the Beginning. So. Alan says, finished Fallout on Amazon, reading the last books in the Anno Dracula series. So, have you guys watched Fallout? Alan, was Fallout good? Um, have you guys watched it yet? I have not. No. Does it look interesting to you guys? Good. It's good? You liked it, Rick? Very good. Have all you right. seen it all, or are you still in the middle of it? In it all. Okay. Great. Awesome. Would I, would I like it? It is um, sort of a post 
apocalyptic western. Right. Okay. It's that, 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 that's only a part of it. There's three main characters, and one is sort of a, a Sergio Leone, Leone of a bounty hunter. And he's okay. called the Ghoul. He's a guy who he, he, he looks like the Red Skull almost. It's Walter Goggins. Yeah. Maybe I'll watch an yeah. episode tonight. Yeah. He is excellent. Rick, did you play the games, uh, the Fallout games? No. Or have There's familiarity about it? Okay. My my son did. It's really interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's odd open world. That the movie is set in twenty seventy seven, but it's sort of a parallel world where twenty seventy seven is it's culturally like the fifties. Hmm. I'll have to ask Logan if he's interested in watching it. And they, and they also have black and white television, not color television. <laughs> hey, Mike. Yeah. Uh, I just sent you a Facebook message. Why you don't want to go and do a thing like that? Hmm. Well, because this just dropped and I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I know a little bit about it. Let me look at this Facebook message. All right. Um, oh, you know what? It says Peter Rollick messaged you. The Cthulhu Heresy a... and yep. Other Lovecraftian Sins by Pete Rollick? Yep. What the hell? This is the first I've heard of this. Weird, I know. Weird House I've... Press. Yep. I don't even. Yep. I We just finalized everything this week. So I didn't expect them to announce it, but they did. Wow. So oh, if you congratulations. Pop... Pop Who's that the up. publisher? Weird House. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So, uh, uh, is it available to pre-order yet? Pre-order. I think they're putting the pre uh, pre-order up next week. Okay. Oh, nice. So, Will it be out in time for Necronomicon? I don't know because those are the things that I would really wanted to discuss before we announced anything. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, that's I'm what we call a good problem to have. I'm feeling very Alan Tudyk right now. This is some <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> some bullshit. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about it? Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I, wasn't I guess. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, your elevator pitch, please. Tell us about it. <laughs> um, the elevator pitch is it's a collection of short stories by Pete Rollick, some of which have not been seen before. Uh, or some of which have only been available um, in very, very limited release. Mm -hmm. Like there was one that was in the Daily Lurker at the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. Oh, um, wow. So very few people saw that. Um, there yeah. is a secret. Yeah, I wrote a, a story for one of those. and I think 100 people read it. That was it. Yeah. There's a modern sequel to the Dunwich Horror. Um, and then there's all four... Um, stories in what I call my Cthulhu heresy uh, quartet um, which you know I can't tell you the premise of but you know it's it, it's kind of fun it uh, throws all of uh, the Cthulhu mythos on its head because you know I I wanted to do that but yes Alan Smalling wants to know if it will be out in hardcover uh, it will be apparently when we're going to negotiate soft cover, hard cover, and limited edition. Okay. Oh, nice. And Mike Davis so, wants to know if it'll be out in Kindle. Uh, I can say maybe. <laughs> I don't know what Weird House. To, I, yeah, probably. There's a 50% chance. <laughs> yeah. There's a 50% chance it's going to rain. I tomorrow. don't know. I mean, they. I was just scrolling through my You're just a writer. Face. You don't know. Yeah, exactly. They don't it's... tell me these. So. Well, what you need to do. No, no, hang on a second. What you need to do, and I'm serious. When the pre-order comes up, you need to email me so that I can post it in, in the group and post it yes. on the big Facebook page. You know, there's a lot of people on that page. I, yeah. let's, let's, so, let's have them buy the book. Here's the secret that I did to not life? know. No. To writing is writing the book is the easiest thing you could do 
being a writer. The promotion, the negotiation, the contracting, the editing, the discussion with the artists, the bookkeeping on where your stories have been published and when, when your contracts for those stories expire so that you can reprint them. Who has those rights? All this, like there's this, there's this, this thing called writing and then there's this thing called the business of writing, which is really, really complicated. And like when you have lots and lots of stories to keep track of, I, mean, I have an Excel spreadsheet trying to keep track of everything and it's going to collapse. I know it. I will once um, again say this is a good problem to have. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the, they don't tell, nobody tells you about the whole, you know, business of writing. Well, now yeah. everyone watching it. knows. Yeah. You've it's, just told them. The industry it's, secret. Yeah, it's it's really, really hard. <laughs> and I get why why some guys ha pay a lot of money to have somebody else manage their stuff. Yeah. But anyway. Anyway, that just, that literally just popped up 11 minutes ago. Wow. So okay. I've, I've been sitting on that for months. Mm -hmm. Well, um, do email me when the pre-order is, is ready. Yeah. And I'll, I'll take care of that. Uh, new, speaking of new books, here's, your, here's the third Lovecraftian book of the episode that we're going to promote. I think I'm reversed. It's mystery. Mur I am reversed. Mystery, murder, madness, mythos. Edited yep. by Glenn Owen Bross and Brian Sammons. Be uh, yep. You know about this book? I, I do. I, the, I just got it in the mail. So. Oh, it's a great book. Let's see. Tim Wagoner, William Meikle, Lucy Snyder. Oh, Pete Rollick and Sal. The yep. Death of Truth. John Linwood Grant. I like John. Yeah. John Langan. I like, I like that John, too. Yeah. Let's see. Orrin Gray, Don Webb, several others. Yeah. You know, I... It's a nice looking book, too. That's a nice cover. Sorry, go ahead. The Don Webb wrote my favorite modern Lovecraft story. And I have a whole bunch of Don Webb books because I and I love Don Webb and I've appeared in Don Webb anthologies with, with Don Webb. I have never met the man. And he's near you, he's in Texas. He's not near me necessarily if he's in Texas. Hmm. Well, he's closer to you than he is to me. Probably. But yeah, I I I think Don Webb is absolutely fabulous. Um and his story in, in this book is really, really cool. What was your favorite Don Webb story? The yeah. prophe the prophecies of the new Fane Asylum. Which um is a prophecies of, of what? Of the new Fane Asylum. Okay, go on. It's um a guy who's been driven mad by seeing the future. And the future is just our technological future. I mean, wires crossing the world, automobiles, planes. Where can I read this? Um, it's in a couple anthologies. I'll have to. I'll have to get it for you. I'll have to give you a Please. list. Please, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I haven't read it. It's it's in, it is interesting to hear you say that. Um, why is that? Well, no, you've read a lot. You've written a lot. You know. Yeah, I. Um, I You're really an do. Expert on Lovecraftian stuff. So. It, for some reason, that story just has always hit me right where it needs to be. Will you um, give me the title one more time? I'm gonna Google it. Yeah, it's called. I believe it's called the Prophecies of the New Fane Asylum. Prophecies at, a, at the is that an, a location? New Fane? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, let me Prophecies see if I can... Prophecies at New Fane Asylum. Yep. Intrazone, March 2000. Hmm, interesting. Okay. That must be where it, when it first was published. Huh. 
let me see. I, I it's it's been reprinted a couple of times. If we can find the the story, it's when in. They, is it in when they came? Yes, but you'll never find that book. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, but it's in a bunch of years. It's in years fantasy by Catherine Kramer and David Hartwell from I think two thousand and one. All right. All right, I'm going to leave this tab up so I remember to look for it. Well, I looked yeah. up uh, Mystery Murder Madness Mythos. It is, you can you can buy it now. Just look it up on Amazon, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's a good book. It's um basically, it's basically um, murder mysteries uh, around Lovecraftian elements. Mm. Um, I, I like that. A lot. Sal and I, I'm gonna enjoy Sal this. And I did a, um, Sal and I did a uh, a hard boiled detective story set in Lovecraft Country. Um, there's a a, a a a Jewish detective who gets called to a small um, a Jewish town outside Arkham um, during the hottest. And I did I did the research on this. Uh, there was a heat wave back in the 20s. Um, that was so bad that um, people were committing suicide because it was so hot. Um, the um, the wow. railroad tracks were um, warping. What kind of temperatures uh, are we talking about? In the hundreds. Hmm. Well, yeah, um, and, that... and sustained. Sustained for days. Which would be like humidity 100, too? 102 or something or? I had to go back and check it, but yeah, it's, it's document. I did a whole bunch of research because on because that happens here in Texas every summer. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, but this is all over, like this is all over the Northeast. Um, and this drove people to kill themselves. It, yeah, it, I would think wow. it would have to be another at least another twenty degrees. Rick, what? Sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, and like people were walking into the like by the thousand were walking into the ocean just to stay warm. Or stay cool. Um, wow. Yeah, uh, they canceled schools. Um, and for our story, what they canceled was burials. You were not allowed to bury people because mm -hmm. they were afraid that people were going to collapse over and die. Um, uh, digging uh, grave graves. Mm -hmm. So um, this creates a problem for uh, mm -hmm. some... Uh, burying jewish um the jewish dead and in oh, our, yeah. yeah and you know that that creates other problems if you're in lovecraft country so mm -hmm. we played with that idea okay um in the summer of 1920 to 21 it is estimated that 147 people died as a result of a heat wave i don't see anything about suicides though might be a might be the wrong hmm. area. That yeah, is, ever, yeah, yeah. Do you guys ever heard about the uh, the Chicago fire um, that happened? What was it, eighteen seventy one? I think. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. So, the same day there was a fire just south of here where I am in Marinette, Wisconsin, um, in Peshtigo, Wisconsin, and that was an even. I I guess the loss of life was insane because the entire county was on fire the same day as the Chicago fire. And so folks are fleeing the town of Peshtigo and their farms and the outlying lands and trying to get to the Peshtigo river. And it reminds me of Pete, the story that you yeah. were describing because there, there are stories of people who survived because the, the air just was so hot and ignited that people would right. pass out and, and die immediately from fumes and whatnot. And they would jump into wells and survive staying in there for the whole the whole duration of the fire and going into the river to seek asylum from this intense natural disaster wow. and it's really uh, it's actually the topic of a play that i'm just started working on um that's also a murder mystery you know in keeping in that theme um because historical fiction theater is one of my other uh interests so yeah, and when you mentioned that, Pete, that uh, people being in those situations and just, and then the stories that they have afterwards, the survivors, yeah. goodness. 
Yeah, we. Um... You read, you, 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 you ever read Slave of the Plains by Robert Block? I'm going to have to now. <laughs> that That's set during the Chicago fire. Really? Short story, it's in the opener of the way and uh, the early fears. Guys, I got to go Thank cook. You. Um, Thank you. I'll talk to you guys later. What, See you, Pete. What, cook? Awesome. Bon appetit. I got to go cook. You just made me hungry. All right. Sorry. Buddy. Have a good night. Talk, talk to you later. Bye. Iron Chef okay. Rollick signing out. Yep. Yeah. Oh, man. You know, there's, there's a throwaway line in Near Dark where the main vampire, like Lance Hendrickson and Bill Paxton, are like, remember that fire we started in Chicago? And they just kind of <laughs> leave it at right, that. And I'm right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, Block has a different person starting the fire. Neat. Jack That's the Ripper. Who it is. Jack the Ripper. He loves the Ripper. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's an historical figure. Mm -hmm. All right. I have not one, but two Patreons to talk about. Uh... Our friend Larry Baron just started a Patreon. Um, so you guys will definitely want to check that out. Um, I helped him out with that, and he came up with some really great uh, tier benefits. So um, uh, it's just, well, let me, let me pull it up here, and I'll just read you a few. Um, it's patreon.com slash Laird Baron. And let's see his tears. And, and I, <laughs> he's got some fun names for the tears. Uh, it's like mine. He's got a, a on, the, on the levels. He's got a $5, $10, $25, and a $50. A $5. Okay. It's called Blackwood's Baby. Frequent journal entries from Laird, uh, observations and commentary from the Shadow of the Catskills. Um, what's included, journal entries, film, game, and book recommendations. For, that's for five bucks a month. All right, $10, Children of Old Leech. Weekly posts from Laird, essays, flash fiction, videos, and book, film, and game reviews. Excuse me. Plus, of course, the previous tiers. And then jumping up to the $25 level, um, Acolyte of the Great Dark. This is, this is fun. Ex exclusive serialized projects from Laird. Writing memoirs, stories, videos, and more. Plus all the previous benefits, of course. Uh, I mean, if you're a Laird Baron fan, I don't see how you can not do this unless you can't afford to, which... Some of us can't, so. Uh, Rex's Pack is the $50 level. Join the pack. A video chat with Laird once a month. Join Laird and the other patrons at this level for a Zoom call once a month with Laird Baron. Exclusive excerpts of Laird's upcoming stories and novels. That's huge. A semi-annual prize drawings. Uh, plus all the previous tier benefits. So anyway, yeah. That's that's really cool. Um, he's been thinking about it for a while. Jessica and I have been trying to talk him into it for a while. So I'm, I'm glad he did it. Um, now, let's talk about a lot, another Patreon. And that would be mine. Um, the... Uh, I, I need to increase that Patreon, and that is not level, I mean, the amounts. I need to get more Patreons. And that is not to say, of. I hope, obviously, that I don't appreciate the Patreons I have, because I very much do. And, um, you know, I asked them about it recently. Uh, quite a few of them said it really is a great value for the money. Um, I was, I'll tell you something real neat first. One of my Patreons, Andrew, he's at the $50 level, and he saw my post about this from last night, and he said that um, 
excuse me, medication and dry mouth kind of thing. He said that for the rest of April, and this is April the 14th, for the rest of April, he's going to match anyone who joins the Patreon, you know, from mm-hmm. last night on. So in other words, if you join the Patreon at five bucks a month, he's going to match that for me. And uh, I, uh, this is incredibly generous of him. He came to me with it. Um, I, I mean, I just can't believe that someone would do that, but I, I just really appreciate it. Uh, he doesn't want to see the podcast go away. And so, you know, um, so thank you, Andrew. So there are quite a few benefits. Let me read you mine, okay? And this not to say ignore Laird and and uh, just join my Patreon only. And I'm sure Laird wouldn't say to just join his. So, um, you know, whatever levels you can afford. I Here's what I wrote in the post um, from last night. I... A couple of months ago, I was on Wikipedia looking something up, you know, as we all do. And, you know, there was a banner at the top with their, you know, um, we need your support type thing that they, they occasionally do. And I thought about it for, I actually thought about it um, because I use Wik- Wikipedia pretty frequently. And they were just asking for, you know, three or four bucks a month, you know. If they got that from a lot of people, it really helps out. And um, I thought, how can I not give three or four bucks a month when I use it so much? You know, I'm getting far more of a benefit. And I don't have a lot of money, but I can afford three bucks a month, you know, for something that I use. So same thing goes for, you know, the Lovecraft easing, uh, the podcast, the book recommendations, the the community, um, if that's important to you and you want to see it continue, I don't want to sound like a commercial, but uh, this is my only job. Um, and I really love doing it. I just need to to uh, increase my quote-unquote salary a bit. And let me say something about that, too. I've never really cared about money. Um what I do care about is that, number one, my family's happy. My, my wife is happy. My son's happy. You know, and that we could pay the bills with what my wife and I make combined. And that I have a little left over to buy a book. And I'm happy. You know, that's about all I need. So let me read these benefits. And please bear in mind that if you join the Patreon you're you're doubling um what you're what you're doing thanks to andrew so five dollar a month you get patreon only episodes there's a lot of them uh interviews with paul trimbley ramsey campbell um gwendolyn keist all kinds of uh patreon podcasts in fact there's a lot to choose from so in my welcome email and in my introductory email when you join, I I have a list of, you know, kind of a start here if you're overwhelmed with all the choices. Um, if you join at five bucks a month, you're getting so much for it. Um, so anyway, there's also the Deep Background Patreon series. Um, they get real personal and delve into the who the person really is and, you know, their journey to become the creative person that they are, whether they're a writer, artist, and so forth. So those are really, really interesting. I've done quite a few of those now. One of them with Ramsey Campbell. So very, very interesting stuff. $10, hang out with the patrons, uh, excuse me, hang out with the panelists once a month, uh, twice a month, actually, um, in a Zoom call. It's not recorded or broadcast, and we have a lot of fun. Um, I'm starting something new on that level, uh, exclusive journal entries 
from me, what I'm reading, things like that. Uh, I won't go over everything here because I don't want to bore everybody with uh, tier benefits. But just very quickly, at the 25 level, dollar level, oh, I haven't said the neat, the neat words, neat names. Cultists is the five dollar level. Deep One is the ten dollar level. Night Gaunt is the twenty five, and you get books uh, once a month. I'll send you a print book, and you have access to digital um, eBooks. That um, I get a lot of those um, advanced review copies and so forth, and I share these with the Patreons at this level, always with permission of course, but th that adds up to a lot of Kindle books that you don't have to buy. So yeah, that's a pretty neat benefit. Um, and then at the $50 level, uh, there's some extra benefits. Plus, you can be a guest panelist on the show once a month. So uh, anyway, that's just, just the link is in the show notes. And I really appreciate the support and whatever you, whatever level you decide to support at, Andrew is going to double it. So, yeah. Uh, Mike, do you think that would actually go for uh, just the Patreon month to month or single bulk uh, donations as well? Both. Yeah. He's going to match anything, you know, up to a certain level. Okay. Because um, I've been thinking about that since your message last night. And what I would like to do, and I'm making this pledge to you in front of the world, whoever's watching, that my royalty check for forbidden knowledge is going to be coming in this next month, I think. And it's going to go to the easy podcast. And oh, I just wanted well, to give that message that, out. Man. No, no, no. That's I really, generic. I think it's totally worth it. I think um, I, I, I don't write, like you said, money has its value, but I think bringing people together and in a world where there are increasingly number uh, an increasing number of distractions that keep people disconnected. I think you're, you're doing real service. Um, by having built and 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 uh, supported such a big community. And so I would just encourage other artists or authors or creative content creators to to pitch in and do the same. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Wow, I don't know what to say. Thank you seems kind of a very small thing to say after, no, just, after that. I really appreciate it. Well, really appreciate what you're doing, Mike, uh, the way you're bringing people together, because that's... And you're bringing them together for 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 a really good reason, and um, people need connections. You know, they need to to need a sense of belonging, and I think that's yeah. what you guys provide. So, I really want to support that. Thank you, I, and I really have wanted that community aspect since the beginning. Um, so I appreciate you saying that. Um, Alan says, "Excellent." Tony just sold me his book. Um, yes, I got the link right. So they're asking for the link in the. Um, in the live chat so give me like one second and i will do that here we go and almost there <laughs> brian says uh, faith in humanity restored so <laughs> thank you thank my you, wife Tim. always says when you have something good pay it forward so yeah you know, share it that's and yeah. when you believe in something, um, you have to you have to step up. And I think I think there are a lot of people, other creators of content, art, music, writing who who could who could help out at this at this time, because we all want to see the Easy and Podcasts continue. Well, you know, um, the, thank you um, again. But and there's a lot of, you know, it. I'm sure we've all seen something really cool end that we liked or whatnot and we're like oh, i wish that hadn't happened um but the fact is you know a lot of the time it's just they weren't able to to monetarily sustain it um fortunately we live in a world where we have to make money um but um and the other thing is if i've um if i've you kind of beat me to the you kind of beat me to the finish line here tony because i was going to also going to say no i appreciate it i was going to say that if if you're a writer artist whatever type of creative and i've i've supported your work or posted about it or had you on the show or whatnot i 
I will never not support someone because they're not a patron. That's that's not how I work. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. But just maybe consider, if I've helped you, consider maybe um, the support could both go both ways. And um, I'll stress again that it, I, I, I'm, I don't believe in a pay-to-play thing. If someone emails me and says, you know, I, do you think your your audience would be interested in this? And I do. I'm going to share it, you know, whether they're a patron or not. But I just it's something to consider. So, oh, Andrew's watching. Says you just sold him his book as well. So, well, all right, Andrew. Very generous I, match. I'm glad. I, I'm glad that that match was there. I did not anticipate that. So I, I found out like 30 minutes before the show. That's exciting. <laughs> Andrew Thank you, Andrew. Me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if I don't know if you've watching, been watching the whole time, Andrew, but I said some nice things about you. And thanks again. All right. Thanks for bearing with me on that. I hope you guys will will jump in on the Patreon. Commercials over. Um, do, 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 do. Hey, Mike, I got a very yes. quick question for you. Yeah, How's go ahead. Oreo doing? Oh, thanks for asking. Um, she has to she has to take um, steroids and gabapentin like every other day. Mm -hmm. um, but I I've got cause to hope because um, earlier today she ate like just one bite of the the dry food, you know, mm -hmm. which which hurts her mouth when um, when I guess all those sores are there or whatever. And she just ate one, and she was kind of afraid of it. But at least she ate that bite, and she didn't. She didn't scream out when she did it, which just which just tears my heart out, you know. Um, so I was, I'm really encouraged. I don't think she'll ever get to the point where she can eat much hard food again. But if she's not in pain, um, you know, she's gonna have to stay on steroids and gabapentin, which is why she's more expensive right now. But She's worth it. So, <laughs> she and she's she's right over. Oh, where'd you go, Oreo? She's the she's the Lovecraft Easy mascot. She's the only one allowed in my office. So, so anyway, uh, we talked about Fallout. I was going to ask you guys about that, uh, Rick. If you liked it, then I, I guess I'm gonna I'll, I better watch it. I'm sure I'll like it too. All right, let's see. As yeah. Has anybody watched X Men ninety seven yet? Yeah. Great episode. Yeah, you saw the last one, Rick? Yeah. I, I was not expecting that. That's if you haven't of me too. Yeah. I was just like I yeah, I, I, I kinda like my a, I thought this was gonna be a filler episode at that point. That's what they just said. It, it is not. It is and then probably suddenly, the best thing Marvel nowhere. Wow. Everything happened. What yeah, are, it's what is X Men ninety seven? It is if you remember uh back in the literally in the nineties, yeah. Uh there was an animated X Men show that I think it ran for like three seasons. I remember watching it. Um probably more than five. It, was it five, Rick? It's been it obviously it's been five. ages. Ninety two to ninety seven? I'm looking it up right now because I think I remember seeing that. Was it was that on uh, the kids shows or was it? Fo I think channel? it was on Fox. Saturday, okay, Saturday mornings. Yeah, this literally picks up. I mean, they've made it. Obviously, they've made it now, but it picks up literally where that one late left off. Do I need so to watch that first? Um, I wouldn't. Nah, okay. no, no, right, Rick. Well, I mean, if you have some basic if, knowledge if of the X Men, the, if you don't know the X Men. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, kind of. I, I used to watch the anime, the uh, this whole animated series. And series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they kind of took the stories from the comics, and you know, they wasn't word for word or blow by blow, but they kind of condensed them and adapted them for the the TV show. And they did like one of the episodes condensed like a whole story arc. Okay, you know, wait, from the, can this we, new season. Can we back up a second? So this is an is this yeah, is sure. a new series yes okay is it yeah, animated just, or live action 
This is animated. Okay, and where, it, where can I where can I watch it? Disney Plus. On okay. Disney Plus. All right. Is it an extension yeah, it, of the original series from the nineties? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. The the animation it does it very well, and they really. I think there's going to be an easy out of, uh, out of what happened. You do. I'm not, which I'm not going to say, but what they did blew, blew your mind away when it happened. Yeah. I, I read it. Yeah, sorry, we're being like so cloak and dagger about this. No, 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 no. Ruin no, it yeah. for anybody that's. We don't, want to ru- we don't want to ruin it for Yeah. Right. right. And, and let me just say, from my perspective, when I watched it, like the first three episodes, I say that for leading up to that point, it's a different tone. There's even kind of like a, a Jubilee episode, which I'm not a the biggest fan where that kind of like is very almost lighthearted and then you go into this the fifth episode which is the most recent one and like rick said it's just like oh mm. oh shit <laughs> it's like that was the point where i'm going i'm hooked you know i gotta see where they're going with this and it's done it's done really well so. <laughs> andrew says in the live chat <laughs> x-men 97 is amaze balls good and alan <laughs> hughes says uh if you if you if you last read the X Men in the eighties and nineties, that's the basis for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah definitely. Okay. That was I kind of like the nineties is when I into the nineties when I stopped uh, collecting X Men, but mm-hmm. you know a lot of yeah yeah so yeah definitely if you're an X Men fan or you're not I w- I would check it out I like I liked that episode more than I have any recent Marvel movie. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, well, that's not a high bar, though. <laughs> true, true, but you know, give give it credit where credit's due. Yeah, and there's two. There's definitely a second season. I I don't think did we cover this before? About there's the showrunner that did X Men '97. Did this season? I think did they already do the second season, Rick? Or yeah, right. I think they. Close. I think I. I don't know. I think they contracted to it. He got fired the day like before the show came out. We don't know why. Yeah, it just mysteriously. So I'm assuming two, like they're definitely doing two seasons, but for whatever reason, he's not going to be, whatever work he's done is not going to continue after the second season, which is a shame seeing how, you know, good it's gone out. Like, oh, I don't know. Hmm. So there's that. Well, and they, got, they got a lot almost all the original voices back, yeah. If, if, wow, only if the person died, yeah. Wolverine, the guy who voiced Wolverine, I think, passed away. That's one of Rogue, them. Rogue, uh, the actress who did Rogue, the gray I think actress, that's cool. Chris, yeah, got Summers, Cyclops, I think he's the same. It, yeah, I think he is too. Because when I heard the voice, I'm like, it's either somebody doing a really good imitation of it, because for some reason his voice stuck in my head from the cartoon. So, well, but Mike, yeah, there's do you guys a... ever do? Oh, I have a quick oh, question. No, 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 go, no, go ahead. Yeah, ever do ahead. sing-alongs on the Ezine podcast? Because <laughs> you guys are talking about this show, and all I'm hearing is the the theme song for yeah. the cartoon from the '90s. <laughs> 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 It's one of those it's that, that gets, it's like an earworm. Yes. Like once it gets in there, you're yes. just, it's just the con worm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mike, you, you should ask the, the folks in the, in the chat. you like, is anybody out there? They should, they, we could start a choir, an X-Men choir <laughs> for this moment. Voices that the, the, the theme heard around the world. Well, speaking of superheroes, mm-hmm. I just linked to this in the live chat, but uh, bat, I think you told me about this to Bronzo. Uh, Batman 1989 continues in a brand new novel. Was that you? That was Benjamin. Ben, right, right, right. Uh, I, I just saw it today. Yeah. Star Wars scribe John Jackson Miller's next adventure is in a galaxy closer to home, Gotham City. Uh, this is on gizmodo.com, which I linked to. Um, io9 can exclusively re- exclusively reveal that Miller is pinning a continuation of the legendary Tim Burton Batman movie in Batman Resurrection, a new novel from Penguin Random House. Uh, quoting him, he says, there are dream projects, and then there, there are projects 
you never dreamt were possible. This is the latter. People always ask what world I wanted to get a chance to write in. I never named Burton's take on Batman because I never imagined it could happen. But editor Tim Holler found a way. So that sounds pretty cool. Uh, Resurrection will directly follow the events after the 89 movie. Um, as Batman's fight to protect Gotham in the wake of the Joker's death continues. Ever vigilant, Batman battles the remnants of the Joker's game, gang, but between criminal t turmoil, the lingering damage the Joker's gas attacks had on the city, and trying to imagine a future for himself beyond crime fighting, he realizes it will take both of his masks to try and pull Gotham back into the light. Excuse me. The Cowl of the Great Cape Crusader and the Wealthy Pocketbook of Bruce Wayne. Um, I, Batman shaped the writer I am. I saw it in the theater 12 times. Hmm. <laughs> well, it, this is where I admit that this is the only movie that I saw like at least five or six times in the theater. <laughs> yeah, hey, I can't Lua. think of another movie that I did. I even saw twice in a theater. Oh, wow. My Star question Wars for you for guys, yeah, right. Star Wars, who's your favorite Batman portrayal of Batman in films? Rick and Mike and Mike, uh, uh or Larry Darrow. I, still, go I still go with Kevin Conroy. I'm sorry, live action. You said. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> Kevin Conroy. I'll, I'll go with Kevin Conroy too. Yeah, it's all right. Just, he's so that is so ingrained. It's like when I read, oh, I love him pretty much. No question, everybody, like, yeah, when you read a comic book or, or even if it's prose like it's kevin conroy mm -hmm. live my action favorite, um you go rick i would say my favorite batman movie is mask of the phantasm which was yeah true movie. there you go animated but it's great um think, yeah go ahead sorry i was just gonna say i think there's been some some good batman but no one's really kind of hit the nail on the head. So it's, I could say good things about Keaton. I could say good things even about like about Bat and Affleck about the most recent Batman. And, you know, they're, they're really good for this. You know, I could say this and that checks and balances, but I don't think we have had a, a definitive mm -hmm. Batman that really captures what's in the page. Well, so I'm going to cast for that. If you could. Is there anyone today working actor that you might cast as a as a your number one Batman? Oh wow, well, I don't know. I, I mean, if I can't, I can't Jensen do it. Jensen Ackles really wants yeah. to play him. Hmm. I'd like to see what he he physically. He's tall enough. He's not. He wouldn't be a short Batman. He's like six one six two. Well, so who are you talking about? Jensen Ackles. Jensen Ackles. Supernatural. Dean. And he's doing the. Doing the voice work for the animated movies. Yeah, he is. The guy who plays Jack Reacher really wants it too. I don't yeah. see that one. I don't, but if the way they draw Batman in the comics now, he's definitely got the body for it. Well, let me answer the live action one. Uh I can honestly say that when I ask myself that question, I'll name several that I really like that you can't pick a favorite because it's it's not it's apples and oranges i love uh michael keaton's take on batman obviously yeah um batman returns uh, i love even more than the original um than, even better than the 89 movie um then of course that all went to shit um i am not much of of a fan of the um sorry who was the the dark knight actor christian bale christian bale christian bale thank you i'm not much of a fan of of his take um although i, I will say i enjoyed the movies for what they were i did not enjoy the third in the trilogy but um yeah um he seemed more less a Batman than he seemed like uh, James Bond in a bat suit, if that makes mm. sense. And if you if you look at the trilogy, 
Bruce Wayne in this in this world in this universe is only Batman for about a year and a half, and then he shelved. Yeah, and then he and then he hides because he takes the blame for um, what Harvey Dent did. Dent. Yeah, mm. and then he comes back what eight years later, and. You know, he's Batman for, what, a couple of months and gone again. That's my biggest problem with that trilogy, is he's really not Batman very long in any of it. I mean, when, when the latest uh, Batman, uh, you, know, you know, came out, the, uh, I'm really having a hard time with names tonight. What was the latest movie with titles? The latest oh, Batman uh, movie. Oh, The Batman? Oh, right. The Literally Batman. The Batman. You know, even when that begins, he's been doing it for two years. Um, yeah. You just can't really be Batman, you know, in a year and a half. It takes what it they, takes longer. They could have fixed that with one line. Like, he's mm -hmm. been a vigilante and been hunted by the cops, but he's still exactly. out there doing his thing. Mm -hmm. And, like, five years later, he decides to hang it up. Yeah. So at least you've given him enough time to be, right. you know, just not a flash in a pan or some nut in a bat suit. Yeah, you don't just because that's what he looks like, man. Yeah, yeah. So I'll go on to Affleck and um, the the newest Batman. Um, what's his name? Uh, Pattinson, Robert Pattinson. Right. My my. I'm not an idiot, folks. They just get really bad fibro fog sometimes. Um, I really like both of them. I like Michael Keaton. My yeah. my three favorites. Are Michael Keaton, Ben Affleck, and um, Pattinson. Ben Affleck, you know, I thought was especially in Batman v Superman, the ultimate Batman. Now he he'd been pushed over the edge by a lot of his employees being killed because of Superman and Zod. Um. But then you see in Zack Snyder's Justice League, he pulls back from that. And he just, if you think about Pattinson, Christian Bale, even Michael Keaton, if you think about any of them defeating Superman, they they wouldn't, you know? Do um, you guys agree with me on that? They just, they just couldn't. But Ben yeah. Affleck's Batman, he's more... The Batman of the comics, to where he, you know, almost always wins. Um, I, go ahead. One thing I want to point out about Batman v Superman was the warehouse scene. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best rendition of him how he would fight. Like, take yeah. it. Out, forget the context of the movie. Like, if you just imagine a live action Batman, mm -hmm. how he's portrayed in the comics where he's mastered all these martial arts and it's just right. like that that was borderline so superhuman fucking badass yeah, yeah. that it borderlines like, exactly borderline superhuman just like in watchmen um they're so because that's what this guy does yeah the, in watchmen they're so good at at fighting that it's almost as you say um supernatural or superhuman remember when in watchmen when uh they're walking and the couple are walking and they go into a, an alley and these all this this gang's following them and um, they just look at each other. He puts his glasses in his pocket and they just go to town on these guys. It's not even they don't even break a sweat. When they go to bust Rorschach out, right? They're having fun, right? And they're yeah, they're they're with like fucking murderers and shit. Right, they're in a prison full of people that want to kill him. So, so Ben Affleck's Batman is the only one who could defeat Superman. But you know, when the Batman starts the voiceover, which is exactly like a lot of the comics, where he's got journal entries, you know, in the in in what you're seeing in the story, and what well, it rained in what seventy percent of the movie. Like, there's Gotham yeah. City again, which it seems to have yeah, its own weather, you know. <laughs> It's got it's, his, it's got his, yeah, it's yeah, exactly. So, uh, to answer your question, Michael Keaton, Ben Affleck, and uh, Robert Pattinson. I like him. Who is it's... your favorite Joker? Oh, that's a good one, Heath Ledger. 
Yeah. I go with that. Yeah. I'd have yeah. I'd have to say Heath Ledger. That was that was that was some acting, man. That was would acting. You ever, would you ever imagine that you had two Oscar winners playing the Joker? Really? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every time he's on screen, it's just like, you know, he steals a show. Yeah, he's he so owns the it. scene. Yeah. 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 Well, this is a good day. We talked about Batman. <laughs> Let's before we get off Batman, it's it's a shame that Affleck didn't get to make that Batman Deathstroke movie. Yeah. It's gonna be a one off. I'm just curious to, it might have sucked, it might have been good, it might have been great, but it would have been nice to have seen it with him just doing his own thing, not connected to the other superheroes. And it sounded like they've said like, you know, it would be I forget why Deathstroke wants to ruin his life, but it would be dismantling him everything he because he knows who batman is it's bruce wayne so it'd have been cool yeah i, don't know. I will say in that horrible the, you know the flash movie when you see the Ooh. affleck batman i mean what what did they get advice from joss whedon on that scene you know, <laughs> no, it, at the beginning. Just, my god i tried to forget that whole movie yeah me too maybe if i wish i could go back in time and keep that movie from happening because i would i would do it mm-hmm. It would make a better movie than the movie we got. Did Mark Hamilton um, voice the Joker in the animated series? Yes. Mark Hamill. That... Mark Hamill. Yep. Or Mark, yeah. Mark Hamilton. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. I love the, the musical <laughs> Hamilton to the point where, yeah. There you go. Yeah, he did. Have he, to get he's, more he's, Hamill and Hamilton. He's fantastic. Exactly. Mark Mark Hamilton. Star Wars meets U.S. history. <laughs> All of that said, life. I'm... Total, I'm in total agreement with Rick and DeBronzo here about Kevin Conroy and also, of course, Mark Mark Camel, who's the Joker to to Conroy. Right. She's just both of them, so so amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really. Um, you know, they, when uh, when they uh, reset the movies in what around 2012, something like that, the animated movies, and replaced Kevin Conroy for a couple of movies. It was just really disappointing. Yeah, the guy they had was Jason, I can't remember his last name, but he did like, uh, did quite a few of them, right? That's a long cycle. Yeah, and and, you know, I'm not... It was the Patriot on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I think he played the Patriot in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, he did a he did a good job. I mean, but, yeah, it wasn't but, horrible, but it's but he's not killing anybody. Conroy. That, yeah, anybody that followed Conroy was going to be compared to Conroy, so you're kind of screwed no matter what. How good you are, yeah, right. Look, burn, burn the burn the piano and say, hey, follow that. Um, did, yeah. Did you with uh, that? Uh, you guys... this... Oh, go ahead. Well, no, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. The disappointment you're describing uh, when Conroy was gone, Mike, would anyone else equate uh, David Duchovny's departure from X-Files for a couple of seasons and then coming back with that level of disappointment? Or are you guys more fans Yeah, I remember always, like always and... thinking, eh, these are okay, but where's, where's Mulder? Where's Mulder yeah. Scholar? yeah, yeah. And the thing was Duchovny wanted to do movies and he didn't exactly hide those feelings. So yeah, once he well, was going, he, he you thought he knew, was like... going to be an above the title superstar, then didn't work out. You know. Yeah, I saw some of the movies he was in. Um, but uh, <laughs> right, yeah, that's right. Certain... You, you make a point to watch bad movies. I forgot about that. <laughs> Even he could settle for being a hand model. Don't know their bed. All right, before, before we get off <laughs> Batman, see you later. Before we get off Batman, right? Yeah, I, ne- I ne- have. I showed I you that guys. This Batman. Um, yeah, I showed you that. Well, a while back. No. That's called, really cool. Gotham, 1919 to 1939. And um, it's a history oh, of nice. that time period. Hmm. Gotham City, Harvey Dent, district attorney. Hmm. It's not It's not only all these photos. I mean, it. you leave through this like it's, it's something that really, really happened. Um, 
and it's just so amazing. And yeah, here's the headline. I know it's reverse. It says Joker wanted by seven states there. And um, it's the proper direction for us. Oh, is it? Yeah. So okay. when you hold that up, yeah, that's pretty right. slick. Maybe I'm wrong. That's a cool book. It reminds yeah. me of the the uh, the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society stuff they put out for Call of Cthulhu. All right. the the maps and props and stuff. Right. Mm, really exactly. nice quality. And there's you know? the the text too is just so amazing in this book. There's oh, wow. there's Two Face. Um, that's a cool shot. Yeah. Let me actually let me um let me pin me. I think that should do it for everybody. Yep. That's so cool. This is expensive. I did not buy this book. Uh, Kelly Young surprised me out of the blue and sent it to me. Uh, what a, I mean, it's a wonderful <laughs> gift. There's Killer Croc. And, you know, I've just been reading this off and on. Just, it's just pretty cool. So if you do have the money um, and you're a Batman nerd like me, uh, you'd really like it. So. Speaking of the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, mm -hmm. they have a new um, talk adventure. Mm, oh, those radio plays, those the radio theater, those are amazing. Mm -hmm. CDL. Which one is it, Rick? Uh, this one is a it's this one's a kind of strange. It, no, it does work. It's a French horror story rewritten as an adventure of the recurring character Nate Ward, who has been in some original. Oh. Is the this Iron the Iron Maiden? Maiden? Iron Maiden. Huh. It, it's got a plot like Clark Ash and Smith's The Disinterment of Venus. Based on the French story, which influenced Clark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, as I've said many times, a huge fan of audio drama, um, starting with old time radio and you know modern. Um, there's some great modern audio dramas, and the the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society has done a wonderful job with the Lovecraft yeah. um, stories. Mm -hmm. Dark Adventure Radio Theater. Anyone listening, if you haven't uh, tried to listen to any of those, you check them out. Um, we let's Necronomicon. We got to see them live too, right? Yeah, which was awesome. They did the that was um, so much fun horror in the museum, right? They did the horror museum. That's one we wanted to go see, but they did two others as well. I think Kersey Yeg was oh. one, and I can't remember what the other one was there was a third one yeah i just it's not coming to me but yeah they're so great i was re really looking forward to it but i had to um i after a while i just had to leave the the room that they were in because um my, i'm deaf in one ear and then so it makes a lot of noise run together you know like i hear somebody oh, speaking okay. but I can't hear exactly what they're saying, and that—that's what that was happening there. So I was like, "Ah, damn it!" But plus, you had crowd participation too, because they're yeah. like, "Okay, we're making noise." Yeah, Which exactly. Great for us, but it probably sucked for you. Yeah, well, and um, but you know, I can listen to the uh, the CDs or the MP3s; they're really mm -hmm. wonderful. So yeah, yeah, check it out, folks. Next yeah, time, absolutely. I'll try to remember to. They sent me. Volume one and volume two, all these CDs and props and everything. It's way over there, but I've been listening to those and I'll try to remember to show those on camera next time. So I Thanks. can't even imagine what those cost. So thank you mm -hmm. to the HP Lovecraft Historical Society for sending me those. So, well, okay, guys, anything else? Yeah, has anybody huh? here seen the half hour version of uh, the evil clergyman? The one with Jeffrey Combs? Yes. Long time no, ago. but it was... I have it on my watch list on Tubi, I think, because I saw it one day. Is it good? Yeah. It's, it's uh, on... I think Tubi was where I saw it. 
It was made, Wasn't I think it was made in the late 80s. Hmm. Even though it, what makes sense? It was lost for a while. I think it just got found, I think, in 10 years ago or something. Wasn't the story it was part of an anthology film or something, but they took that part out? It was an anthology film that never got off the ground. It was never finished. And uh, the, the print got lost. Oh. It was Jeffrey Coons, Robert Crampton, and David Warner. Oh, nice. and is it called yeah. the evil... Andrew's asking about it. Is it called the evil cler clergyman? Clergyman. Evil clergyman. Yeah. On Tubi. And there's a character from a. The evil clergyman is based on a dream of Fred Soul is the a fragment, short right? Story. But it has a character from another more famous Lovecraft story in it, too. And you said no, it's I'm on. Not mention. Okay. You said it's on Tubi, Rick? I think it's. Uh, I found it on some public domain. I think it. I think it's to be. Uh, if you just do a Google search, you can find um, the streamers. Uh, it's on. So just go to just watch uh, website. I can evil clerk and tell you where you can find it. As uh, Tubi says, watch the evil clergy clergyman twenty twelve. Doesn't seem right. And that's gonna well, be. Yeah. That's when it came out. Oh yeah, it might have been when it was released. Yeah, so. that's when when they when they when they found the. The lost print. Hmm. Oh, I uh, yeah, okay, I get it. Uh, it's a half hour. Yeah, this is it. I just Andrew, I just googled the evil clergyman and Tubi, and it takes you right to it. You don't even have to sign in. That's pretty cool. Doesn't look like you have to anyway. Yeah, Tubi's been great for horror movies. Oh, God, it's just, yeah. I mean. Yeah, there's commercials, but who gives a shit? I mean, it's free, and then their catalog's pretty... The thing is, if the you commercial... Know? You know, first, it's not like Prime, where we were getting no commercials for what we paid, right? Yeah. And then suddenly they take that away. It, it, it's not... If the commercials are just like 30 seconds, 60 at most, for a free service, yeah. I'm fine with it. Yeah. It's when you get into two, three, there. four minutes that I'm I'm done, you know? Right, like the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. That's or there's just there's so many of them spaced out. Ah. They just you you get your little thing, of, you know, and then you get a nice big block of the movie. I'm fine with that. Yeah. And they wouldn't get a shit if I wasn't in the year. So. Yeah, so, I yeah. was I was just thinking this too. I'm glad we. I'm really glad we do this. Um, all these recommendations and you know I learned from you guys too. It's not. I didn't know about this. Uh. Andrew says, "Wow, this is why I watch this pod watch this podcast." By the way, and he goes, "Already on it. Guess what I'm doing tonight?" So, <laughs> which a lot of people yeah, are probably every, thinking right now too. <laughs> every Tuesday, I go through Prime, I go through Tubi, I just see what's the new drops because usually it's a Tuesday. Yeah, and sometimes it's Friday too. So, those are the two I hit first. It's Friday, Friday. Hey, did you guys? I know we're trying to wrap up, but the evil clergyman, uh, Kim, evil clergyman. Go ahead. Mike. I I had sent you guys on the on the chat the article about alien Romulus. It's oh, it's yeah. not saying that the you know it's coming out later. There's no guarantee the movie's good, bad, or whatever. We won't know till we see it. But what's really cool is they got the guys back from Aliens that did the practical effects. Oh, on the aliens, so. Mm -hmm. They interviewed Fede Alvarez, who's the uh, director. He says most of this is practical. The xenomorphs, and then we tried to take CGI nice. and enhance the practical instead of just. I mean, there's some scenes of like if you've seen the um, the teaser trailer, there's and this is no, not a spoiler. It's in the trailer. There's a bunch of face huggers coming out, jumping around. I mean, he said some things. You know, you just that's the way to go. You. Otherwise, you don't get that. You couldn't pull it off. But everything else, though, that just that'll get my ass in the seat just to see the practical effects. Doesn't mean it's going to be a good movie. Hopefully, it is. Mm -hmm. But I just I love practical, and it just pisses me off. We never got the evolution of CG backing up the practical to make it look perfect because you know it's in the room with the actors, and that makes it believable. I see CGI yeah. half the time, and it's just like you know I'm in a cartoon. 
it's it's hard Not the suspension of disbelief is harder in, yeah yeah with the cgi there is a good uh half hour film on youtube comparing uh alien to it the terror from beyond space the new 1950s oh, yeah. movie oh really probably inspired it i forget i forget what the channel is but just type in uh alien and it the terror and you get it I I got it on DVD. Yeah, I know exactly your talk because Carpenter, uh, John Carpenter, points that out too. Yeah, like it's either Carpenter or somebody else. There's like I saw that, and it's definitely an influence on Alien. And when you see the movie, it's like, yeah, I get it now. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's worth checking out. Well, Tony, thanks for being on the show. Thank yeah, you sorry, so much you. for having me. Sure. No, I it's jumped nice in to... after you're done, <laughs> but it's nice That's to meet okay. you. It was nice to meet you too. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And yeah. uh, this has been a lot of fun. Really appreciate the support and right back at you. Well, I do too. I mean, what giving me your, the podcast, your, your check. I really, that's really nice. I, I, I don't even know what to say, um, but except for thanks. And remember, it's Andrew said, extremely he, generous. Yes, it is. Uh, Andrew said he'll match, you know, any donation or, um, new Patreon amounts for the rest of the month. So if you if you join at the ten dollar level, then you're joining at the twenty. So it's the simple version. And here's Tony's book, Forbidden Knowledge: um, Two Tales of Lovecraftian Terror by Tony Tony Lamafa. It's available in print and on Kindle Unlimited. So if you you're on Kindle Unlimited, you can read it for free tonight if you want. So, so yeah. Uh, thanks, Tony. So. Thank you, guys. Nice to meet you, Rick. Thanks again, Mike. Nice to meet you, DeBronzo. And um, nice to meet you too. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, and um, we'll see everybody. I will see, or you'll see me, everybody on the new uh, late night Lovecraft Easing Thursday night at eleven o'clock Eastern. So, just just go back to the. YouTube channel, the Lovecraft Easy YouTube channel, and we'll I'll be there. Uh, Eleven Eastern on Thursday, which will be ten Central and eight Pacific. So, all right, see you then, and thanks for all the support, everyone, and thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.